This episode is brought to you by Wear Buff, your go-to for Buffalo-inspired apparel. Get your hands on stylish t-shirts, hoodies, and more at wearbuff.com. That's W-E-A-R-B-U-F dot com. And make sure you use the promo code TWB at checkout for 10% off your first order. Stay Buffalo proud with Wear Buff. The Buffalo Bills get demolished in their preseason opener, losing to the Chicago Bears 33-6. This week on the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast with your host... Justin Gotford. Bills Mafia, welcome into another episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast, a show on the Buffalo Fanbase Podcast Network. My name is Justin. I'm your host today, and hey, we did it. We made it to <laughs> we made it to a football season. Uh, not sure that the Buffalo Bills also made it to the start of the season, but preseason game one is in the books. Obviously, a uh, pretty bad shellac and put on the Bills by the Chicago Bears. And I'll start off right at the top. I'll try not to say this too much. It it's preseason. I know that these games don't count for the record. And it's basically like an exaggerated practice against, like an exaggerated scrimmage with another another team, right? So in the grand scheme of things, you know, taking a pretty brutal L here doesn't really matter. That being said, it is super hard to get hype all season or all off season about, you know, football coming up. We're all waiting for it, counting down the Sundays. You finally get some Buffalo Bills football, and you sat there for three hours and watched that. Um, Kudos to you if you made it through all three hours. I had to do a a second watch on the game. I was working after the game. I was already feeling pretty tired. That game knocked me out somewhere, you know, mid-third quarter. And I had to go back and watch it again because I, I don't want to be here not knowing what I'm talking about. But it was a doozy of a game. And anybody who's not doing, you know, a podcast or some sort of show afterwards that was able to hang in there for the whole game, props because it was it was pretty brutal. There were some some bright spots for me. But I thought overall the team looked kind of flat, uninspired. And I know that we're still getting some of the kinks out, right? Tons of overturn on this roster. I mean, when you look at just, you know, the the easy one for me is how many captains are changing on this team. And, you know, even aside from that, how many long-term players you've had with this team that are changing guard. So like if you're if you're changing guard at at the top of the each position, there's a lot of change in the depth too. So I wasn't expecting, you know, this Super Bowl ready polished team coming out there. I was hoping for, you know, a little bit more. So starting out Just going to kind of go through position by position, some of the things I saw, some of the things that stood out. Um, Starting with the quarterback position, Josh Allen didn't play very much. Uh, It was about the first quarter. Went two of three for 22 yards. Also had a scramble in there. Came away with seven yards on that and a first down. For the limited action we saw, I nothing to complain about with Josh Allen. I like seeing him still being able to use his legs. I love seeing him get down before contact. Don't don't really need to see him running in the preseason. I I do understand the starting offense playing a bit. I know some people never want to see Josh Allen touch the field for a preseason game. There's so much new on this offense 
And, you know, especially between Josh Allen and the weapons, the wide receiver core, you're returning Shakir from last year. So much overturn there, so much to get on the same page. And albeit limited snaps, I'm I'm good with seeing the starters out there. So Josh Allen, nothing concerning there. Mitch Trubisky, a very uninspired. Um, look, it's the backup quarterback position, and I'm not expecting, you know, the next coming of Mitch Trubisky, the career revival at this point. I think that we've kind of seen him get that opportunity with Pittsburgh, and he's back in Buffalo. He's a backup quarterback, and it is what it is. I just always kind of hope, you know, with the name, the draft stock, all that that goes into Mitch Trubisky, you know, the fact that he's getting a decent paycheck. I always want to feel like we have, like, this top-tier backup situation in the league, and I just don't feel that way. Maybe it is a little bit of, you know, the first game of the season, what have you. There's just a few opportunities where he just kind of missed wide open receivers. There was one to Q Morris that would have been a touchdown. Leave another one went to Q Morris that, you know, he just missed him. These are just kind of plays that you have to be making as as a quarterback, whether you're backup starter, whatever, and the dudes are running wide open. So Mitch Trubisky ends the day 10 for 18, 82 yards, two sacks. Nothing overwhelming there, just just kind of meh numbers. Uh, Shane Bouchel comes in after, went 6 for 10 for 53 yards, Threw a pick six and was sacked six times, which is a pretty, pretty rough showing there for Shane Michelle. And I think the one thing that does matter a lot in the preseason is the context of who these guys are playing with when you get into the third team. And I'm going to go to the offensive line next because I think it all kind of ties in with the quarterback. I thought the offensive line today was just just not good enough. And again, I know we didn't see a ton of the starters, but when you get into the second, third teams here, I don't think they looked like they're opening much for holes in the run game. See that with the paltry running, but uh, rushing numbers. I mean, eight sacks given up. I know those aren't going strictly against the offensive line. You know, quarterbacks holding onto the ball too long, whatever. the The pass protection, the run blocking, it just didn't look good today. And kind of waiting for the all twenty two to come out to try to you know, look at each spot and see if there were, you know, individuals shining certain moments, certain big plays, certain negative plays that were, you know, really glaring. It's really hard to get a great grasp on the trenches just watching the game, you know, in your in your standard broadcast view. But just kind of the overall result feeling all that offensive line wasn't great today. So we'll we'll take a further look at that as we move into the next game and and kind of go from there, but not a great day for the offensive line, which kind of moves us into the running backs. Just all around bad game rushing the ball. James Cook had four carries for two yards. Ray Davis, five carries for two yards. Darrington Evans, three carries for 11 yards. Frank Gore Jr. had seven carries for 21 yards. 
So, I mean, your your best average yards per carry there was 3.7 yards. And just overall not much success. I mean, like opening the game, the, the first series, James Cook runs it up the middle twice and has like two carries for negative one yards. And it, it didn't look good from the start, which kind of leads into... You know, you have no threat of the run game, cover the pass more, all that. But, yeah, just in general, I I can put some of this on the running backs. I can, you know, split the blame up between the offensive line. But in particular, when we were trying to run up the middle, it just seemed like everything was like a house collapsing upon itself. And there was just kind of nothing there. I will say the running backs getting involved in the receiving game was encouraging, uh, especially from the the backup running backs here. Ray Davis was able to pull in three catches on four targets for 19 yards, and Frank Gore Jr. added three catches on four targets for 16 yards. So Ray Davis was is somebody that I'm I'm excited for what he can bring to the passing game. So seeing seeing him involved in running routes, you know, he looks like he belongs doing that. Uh, so when the ground game wasn't working, at least encouraged by Ray Davis being able to be involved in the passing game, kind of catch the ball and create a little bit afterwards. Frank Gore Jr. involved in the passing game. I, I wasn't expecting as much. Now he wasn't running, you know, as nuanced of, you know, pass routes, but he was able to hold on to the ball as kind of a check down option and, and create some yards. So overall for the day, running backs much more encouraging as receiving options than than the ground game in this one. The wide receiver room. If you listen to the show, you know this is one that I've been really excited to see how you know some of these position battles shake out and not just on the tail end of the depth chart. I was hoping that we would see some action from the starters. To kind of get a gauge on how this whole new group is coming together. And I will say that I was pretty disappointed that we didn't get to see Matt Collins in this game. Kind of dealing with a little lingering issue. I was really excited to see, you know, the whole new look receiver core together. We didn't get that, but we did get some action from... From the starters in Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel, uh, throw Keon Coleman in there. And I'll say the, the highlight of this group for me kind of gets shared between Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir. Khalil Shakir going three for three for 28 yards and Curtis Samuel two for two for 23 yards. And I think early... On we saw Curtis Samuel and kind of his explosiveness on display, his ability to move around the field. And in particular, he had a screen pass early that was kind of one of these, it was like a jailbreak screen type deal that we saw the Bills try to run a lot with Diggs last year. We didn't have a ton of success there. And to be able to see that wide wide receiver screen early and Curtis Samuel just explode and get up the field and get extra yards with it uh, was super exciting. And I I have to say I'm I'm super stoked for what I think Curtis Samuel is going to be in this offense. Very similar feeling with Khalil Shakir, and he kind of picked up right where he left off. And I did have, slash do have, a little bit of concern of 
you know, Shakir kind of blowing up towards the tail end of last year. And, you know, is this the Gabe Davis situation type deal over again where we're really impressed with what he's done, so we're going to kind of promote him sooner than we planned on. And, you know, when he goes from being the number four option to the number two option, whatever, we see the numbers fall off a little bit. Didn't look like it in this game, and you know he runs super clean routes. He's he gets separation. He's getting open, and then he's got like the sneaky explosiveness too. So he's kind of a similar skill set to Curtis Samuel. And I think one of the things with Khalil Shakir is he's he's been like such a good possession receiver for us. It's like easy to forget that he also has that explosive speed. I'm really excited to see what kind of those skill sets and how they match up with Matt Collins and Keon Coleman as we get into more action and them being more size guys and you know even on the screen plays having them be able to get out front for you know blocking for these wide receiver screens and such. Um so excited about the top end of of the receiving core there. The rest of the receiving group, kind of uninspiring to me. Keon Coleman does come away with one catch on three targets for eight yards. I will say the the one catch that he did have was, you know, a display of him getting really nice separation. He's kind of pressing down the field and cuts the route off and does come back, and the corner kind of just keeps going and... He's able to get the ball and turn it upfield. Not a huge game, not, you know, this huge stat line for him. But what we also didn't have from Keon Coleman was, you know, a bunch of drops on tape, him running around like he doesn't know where he's going, all that type of stuff. So not a super explosive, fun, can't wait to talk about Keon Coleman's debut, which would have been super sweet to do for this show uh, but you know nothing really crazy bad in the other direction either kind of the the tail end of the depth chart in the receiver room is is where I've been looking at the position battles and I don't think I would say anybody from the tail end there really separated themselves in a good way I think KJ Hamler had a pretty rough day. He got in there for his first return opportunity, uh, fumbles a kick return, kind of made up for it a little bit with a, a follow-up punt return he took back for like 15, 20 yards. But he had a drop go right through his hands. Uh, MVS had at least one drop. Terrell Shavers had... A drop as well. This, this was a ball from Mitch Trubisky that was kind of behind him a little bit. Tough catch to make, but kind of a play you got. You you really want to see the guys make when you're talking about you know battling for for one maybe two spots. Isabella had one catch for 15 yards. Lawrence Keys one catch 13 yards. Xavier Johnson had one for nine yards. Just nobody in that group really separated themselves from the pack at all for me. And kind of in... As we move forward with this receiving battle, I I don't think we learned enough from any of these guys to to give me a more clear answer of... of how that's all going to shake out. I think it's something we'll kind of have to take into next week and and see if anybody stands out a little bit more. Um, but I will say, KJ Hamler is somebody that I've been very high on. The first step chart from the Bills come out, and he's listed as the number one returner. So I'm, I'm thinking, I, I kind of had him as, as the fringe guy maybe making it if they kept six receivers. And 
I, I think he kind of just went backwards today, and, and now he's got some ground to make up. So we'll see what happens there. The tight end room, just really nothing doing here. Kincaid had one catch for seven yards, and then the whole rest of the group. I already talked about Quentin Morris having kind of the the two spots where he was open, and Trubisky just misses him. Everybody else, one target, no catches. I will say for for the depth for the tight end three position, how much noise Davidson's been making during camp, I kind of was having him move up and maybe take that spot from, from Morris. After this game, I mean, that that's two catches that Morris should have had that are they're really not on him at all. And Davidson just didn't really do anything to... I think it's on Davidson to overcome Quentin Morris, and I didn't see that happening in this game. And when you kind of package that with the experience Morris has, the special teams that he brings to the table, I think Davidson is somebody that's hard to kind of ignore. But it might be a situation where we see him kind of working with practice squad again and and go from there. Um, but yeah, offensive side of the ball, nothing super inspiring. Spoiler alert, the Bears scored 33 points. There's nothing too inspiring on the de- uh, defensive side either. I'll start with the defensive line. I just didn't see very much to inspire me from the interior of the defensive line. And this was kind of a group I was expecting to to pop a little bit more for the depth that we've added, what we have kind of invested there. And I just, I, I didn't see much that really inspired me at the D-tackle position. Very similar with the offensive line. Again, it's kind of super hard to to get uh, a full scope of what's going on up there. You know, just watching the broadcast view, watching it in real time type deal. So this is one that I'll have to go to the L22 as well and try to kind of get a better idea of who exactly stood out there. But not much really fl- flashing for me. In at the defensive tackle position, defensive end position, and I'll I'll say for the defense as a whole, I think there were some good moments, but there was an awful lot of something that we've seen in the past, and I really hope it gets cleaned up here. Just being able to get the the opposition into third and long situations, and then letting them convert it over and over again. And, you know, we saw all kinds of distances, third and nine, third and 12, third and six. And I think this has a lot to do with the pass rush just not really getting home and whatever. It's it's the preseason you know, we're talking about our depth guys playing and guys that are going to be rotating and kind of have specialized roles and situations and, and what have you. A lot of guys that won't even make the team. But got to have more from the pass rush, and that's across the whole defensive line. So I will say that I was pleasantly surprised with both Kingsley Jonathan and Javon Solomon and Javon Solomon in particular for being a late round pick, a rookie, you know, kind of seeing through training camp, not a ton of buzz about him. Just hearing a lot of like, he's the first guy in last guy out, you know, working one-on-one with coaches and, you know, other players after practice type stuff. 
But like on the field, I haven't been hearing a ton about Solomon. And I thought the two of them together were, they were getting in the backfield and they were, they were having some disruptive plays. So a couple of guys that, you know, the fringe of the t- defensive end rotation, when you're talking Epinesa, Groot, Von Miller ahead of them, thinking maybe they only keep four and go with six D tackles. I think if you keep seeing play like this from, you know, um, Kingsley Jonathan and Javon Solomon, add in the new kickoff rules and, you know, needing guys that can tackle and having it be more of like trench play, I think it might be a situation where we keep an extra D end or two. And that might, you know, come as a blessing for for these guys. The linebacker room, I was overall pretty pleased with. Obviously, we didn't see Matt Milano play today. But some of the depth pieces, I thought, looked pretty, pretty solid. Dorian Williams continues to be really great playing downhill. I don't think that's ever really been a question with him. It's more if he's doing the right things in the past sets. The first watch through, I didn't see anything really glaring about him getting beat in the past game or anything. He did have a tackle for a loss. Kind of hoping we see that next step in the development from Dorian Williams and have him be the first linebacker off the bench if you know, somebody gets hurt or anything. And I thought he looked pretty solid today. Deion Jones looked looked good for being, you know, who he is this to this team. You know, uh, uh, an experienced veteran that comes in and is in the right spots. I would say the player that flashed the most for me here, and, you know, maybe it's a little bit of bias to the story, you know, wanting to see it more. But I thought Joe Andreessen had a really good game with some flashes in there. And the linebacker depth, as it is, we've talked about it a lot on this show, it was kind of one of those positions where it it just got massacred with injuries last year. And you could tell this offseason Brandon Bean didn't want to play that game again and really loaded up on the position. So it's kind of tough sledding for there to be a spot for Andreessen on this roster, but it's nice seeing a guy like that come in and not look like he's in over his head, not look like he's drowning. You know, He looked like he belonged, and albeit, You have to put everything with the caveat of who they're playing against. You know, you're into the third, fourth stringers at this point. But he looked like he belonged to me, and maybe he doesn't crack the roster this year, but you have to root for the the homegrown talent. You know, grew up in Buffalo, went, I believe it was Lancaster High School, went to UB. Those are fun stories, and you think about some of the, some of the guys that are on this roster, Cam Lewis, who came from UB and spent time on the practice squad and, you know, had to take the long road to to a path on the roster, but it's not unheard of for this team. Jamarcus Ingram, another player like that. So, and even to an extent, if Tyler Shavers is able to make this roster, you know, those undrafted guys that come in and put in the work and kind of wait for their opportunity, I, I think we might be seeing, you know, the first little sneak peek of the next iteration of that. In the secondary, I thought there wasn't really anything. It it wasn't that noteworthy for me. And kind of like going in either direction. I don't think anybody was really bad. I don't think anybody really did much to stand out. Though the one thing that really stood out to me was Kendall Williamson and the late hit and you know, watching it again, it 
didn't look like he was, you know, trying to decapitate the dude or anything. He did look like he pulled up a little bit. That's just, it's, the, the ball was clearly, you know, far and away. The reception wasn't being made. And it's just something that you, you can't do in the NFL. There's no spot for it anymore. And being a guy that's, you know, already got an uphill climb to make the roster, taking a penalty like that's not going to do you any favors. So I thought that was that was one thing that stood out in a, in a negative light. The one that I think will kind of get swept under the rug and, you know, lost to history here is I thought Cam Lewis had a really nice pass breakup that they called an illegal contact on him. And I've watched this play five, six times. There's I don't see anything there. It is what it is, I suppose. Uh, but I thought he had a really nice play there, and I think he continues to to flash and have strong moments. And you know, with the with the safety position all banged up, it, it's kind of encouraging to see a level of play from him that I I would feel just about as confident with him in there as one of these other guys, Rap Hamlin insert the name here I think I think the safety position lacks that like elite talent top name that we're, we're used to and Poyer and Hyde obviously but I think what Bean has been able to do is he's assembled a bunch of guys that I think are like on a fairly similar level and like I, I feel good about any of those like any of these selections if they end up being the starter I feel I feel pretty good about them and I've kind of adjusted my expectations for the safety position and I believe it was Joe Marino talking about you know how basically like the safety position isn't what makes or breaks a team for a playoff run. And yes, it was Joe Marino. He was talking about um, kind of evaluating Hamlin and his season where he had a ton of starts due to injury. And you never really felt like, man, this team could win it all if it wasn't for that one safety back there. And it's kind of, it's a nice perspective to look at it from because you, you can, you can lose certain positions in football and have it really, you know, destroy your goals for the season. I think with how defenses are playing in today's NFL, or it's kind of keep everything in front of you, come up, make the tackle, you know, not, not let the big plays get past you. I don't think that you need, you know, the, the super, high end of the spectrum from the safety group. And I think we have a bunch of guys that can be solid starters. Um, so feel pretty good about that group. Cornerbacks, I will say starters weren't in there very long, but very early in the game, Roswell Douglas had a great play, gets in the backfield and has a tackle for a loss. So overall, I mean, the game was 33 to six right? Ton to work on, ton to clean up, and thankfully it's preseason and this isn't, you know, a doozy that we opened the the regular season with, but put a ton of stuff on tape for McDermott to coach these guys up on. I will say, wrapping it up, I'd kind of be remiss not to mention Caleb Williams here a little bit. You know, first overall pick, he gets his first game action against our Buffalo Bills. Uh, from what from what I can take out of it and the little grain of salt that you put into what you see in the preseason, he he looks the part. Um, there is the, the one play that kind of really sticks out to me 
is it's it's a play action running back headed to the left and Williams is rolling to his right and sees his receiver and just cranks one in there it's one of the throws that's like all arm his feet aren't set he's not square none of that just a play that feels kind of routine to us because we've seen Josh Allen do it so many times but it it is, you know, a rare ability for NFL quarterbacks to, to be able to make a throw like that. Didn't see a ton from him in this game either, but encouraging for any Bears fans that might have showed up here. I know the Bears have a history of really really bad quarterback play, and who's the best quarterback in Bears history? It's maybe Jake Cutler. So, for being a franchise in the Buffalo Bills that have really struggled in that department throughout their history as well, little encouraging for, for a team like a Bears to appear to have found their guy. So, wanted to give a little kudos there to Caleb Williams. But that will do it for this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast. We've made it all the way here. I do ask, as always, you like, share, subscribe, tell a friend. Um, All your support helps us keep these shows coming out every week. As we get into the games being played here, the schedule might get a little bit wonky because I'm going to try to get you my reactions as soon as possible. Before I do you know, a game recap show. I always like to watch the game live and then get at least one rewatch of the game. Um, So I won't be recording, you know, immediately after the game ends for the most part. Um, When I have the ability, I I will watch the game at least twice before I give my thoughts on it. So make sure you're subscribed for that reason. If the schedule gets a little wonky, you'll always get the notification that the new episode is out. Like I said at the top of the show, we are on the Buffalo Fanbase Podcast Network. If you made it this far in the show and you went the other way and you don't like it, you don't want to listen, that's cool too. But check out the Fanbase Network. There's shows coming out every day of the week. There's something out there for everybody. If you're looking for Bill's content, there's a show for everybody on the network. So make sure you're checking that out. I appreciate you taking the time out to join me this week. Next week, we will be breaking down the preseason game against the Steelers. In the meantime, as always, go Bills.